viewers and welcome to today's uh, lesson uh, which is a uh, coordination actually it's coordination in animals now last time we were talking about the chemical coordination in plants whereby we were looking at the hormones that are involved in the response in plants now just like the plants do respond animals also do respond to different environmental condition or even the change in their internal body condition so they have to respond so that they become as comfortable and effective in whatever they are doing now coordination is actually making things to happen in the right way at the right time by use of different body organs that is how simple we can talk about it so in normal situations there can be situations that want you to uh, to respond so that at least you don't harm yourself or uh, you be you feel good like for example we can talk about a situation whereby i am standing on the way and then a child throws the ball at me and then to avoid being hit by the ball i can decide to quickly squat down or move out of the way of the ball now in that particular situation there are events of activity that has taken place the first thing that has taken place is that there is a ball coming on my way. So this ball here is making me to feel unsafe. So I have to move out of it, out of its way, so that I don't get hit with it. So when I'm moving out of the way, I am responding. So in this case, the ball is the what is causing me to respond. So the ball, therefore, will be called the stimulus. So under this, we can look at what's called the stimulus, stimulus, and then there is response response so i have said that i have got the ball thrown at me so this ball is making me to feel unsafe so what do i do in the in the process i move out of its way so this ball here become the stimulus and then the act my action moving my action here is the response response so those are two things that have happened here I'm moving out of the way of the ball so that I don't get hit. That one means that I am responding to situation. Or maybe we can talk about an instance whereby you are going home and then you get the smell of food somewhere, a food that you like so much. So in that particular case, when you get that particular food that you get the smell of the food that you like so much, you will find that your mouth start becoming watery. In other words, you feel like you are developing appetite for the food itself. That is also an action that has caused a change in us. So in this case, we are talking about the smell of food. Smell of food. This is now the stimulus now. This is the stimulus. And then the saliva being produced in the mouth. So like uh, producing saliva. This one becomes the response in this particular case. So clearly, we are seeing that uh, we have got what is called a stimulus and we also have got what is called a response. So stimulus is anything that evoke, that provoke you to behave in a specific way. That is called a stimulus. And then the behavior towards that particular thing that you have called stimulus is actually the response. So we can respond to event that is internal or an event that is outside our body they can cause a response so that is one thing that we should be having in our mind as we are going to ponder much into this particular chapter so we have got the surrounding that outside our body that is called external environment and then we have got the internal body environment so this particular conditions can be responded to like internally i can respond to different events like temperature we can talk about the internal environments that can change internal environment that can change here we have got number one temperature my internal body temperature should be consistent as a, an animal or as a human being but it can change it is not always like this so that one can cause me to to respond to that situation I can talk about the blood sugar or blood glucose. Blood glucose. There's a specific quantity of blood glucose that should be there in my blood so that I am active enough or I don't produce too much energy that can cause problem to me or can bring in the imbalance of my osmotic pressure. So if it is 
not balanced enough, I will be having problems. So these are some of the examples of the conditions that I can be balancing in my body. That is internal one. Then external, we have talked about very many things like the temperature. I mean, like a, I'm seeing a danger, source of danger, something that can hurt me. Or I'm seeing some good thing that I should go for. Those are the situations that can bring in a response to me. So how do this particular resp I mean, response that comes in? Now, when I'm responding to a situation, there must be an information that is moving in me. Now, this information is like a small electrical wave that is moving in me. Therefore, that electric wave, we are going to refer to it as an impulse. So impulse here, impulse, we can refer it to it as the, the, the movement of the information from one point to another. So this information is moving as an electric wave or what are called electrical impulses. So it moves a little bit quickly, but not as fast as the normal electric power that we know. It is not that electric power that we know, but it is behaving the similar way because they are involved of the charges, but they are not as quick as we as we are know the electricity that we talk about. So that is now the difference between this one and electrical that we are talking about. Though in both we have got the the charges that are involved in this particular case. So how do the information move in us? Now information will start from the starting point that we are referring to as the stimulus. So there must be a stimulus. From the stimulus here, once we have got the stimulus, this is where the starting point of the information will be. This particular information or the, 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 the stimulus here must be received. So we have got what is called receptor. So we have got the receptor, which in this case are body organs that are going to receive the information from its source. So once we have received the information in us, we are supposed to coordinate it. So we, and we have to understand that there is a coordination. Coordination. So we have to coordinate the information. And then this information that has, to, has been coordinated, it must go to an organ, again, that will make you to correct the situation that you are faced with. Either to be safe or to have what you are accessing and then you enjoy it. So this is called the effector. So from the coordination here, we go to what is called effectors. Again, these ones can be organs. And then we also have got now the actual corrective mechanism, which is called response coming in. So I can respond. So when I, for example, is being faced by Let's assume that uh, this is my finger. I am in a hot object. I am burning. So that particular heat on this particular hot object, in that case, is a stimulus. That is a stimulus. Now, in my finger here, there is the skin as the organ. And this particular skin that is the organ here, is actually having the cells that can be that can pick that particular information and move with it. So the skin and the cell in it is called the receptor. It is the one to receive the information. So I pick that excess heat from the skin, which is burning at that point. And then this particular information, it is raw at this particular moment. So we have to coordinate it so that we can interpret and know the actual meaning of the event that I'm faced with. So these ones will be involving the cells that are now found uh, within the spinal cord up to the brain. So that is where the coordination is actually taking place. So coordination happens within the brain and the spinal cord. And those two make up what is called central nerve system. And then from there, with this particular information will be taken to like in this case, the response that I need to come in, what I should do is to move. So the motion here is created by uh, the, the action of the muscles. So muscles here becomes the effectors. So effectors can be muscles or they can be the glands that will be releasing the chemicals that are 
needed for the response of the situation. And then when I actually bend my arm so that I remove my, uh, my fingers from the hot object, that I'm responding. So the response is here, is seen as a result of the motion. So that is what, the, that is how this particular event moves in. Now, to this particular receptors here, what they normally do, like we can talk about a little bit of uh, the receptors here, uh, the receptors here. What do they do? Now, I have talked about the stimulus. Stimulus are, there are a lot of things here that we need, like we talk about light can be stimulus, we can talk about uh, the, 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 the heat can be stimulus here, we can talk about uh, the taste uh, of a salt being too much there. So when we talk about these particular stimulus, for them to be moved, for this particular uh, stimulus, when they reach us, we have to change the energy that they are having to an impulse so that this impulse can move and then be interpreted. So what is having the, act, the actual power to change this particular stimulus to the impulse that we are having? Now it is the receptor that will be changing. The role of the receptors here is to detect the stimulus and then they change the energy of the stimulus to electrical energy, which in this case we are talking about the nerve impulse. Like for example, I have got uh, the receptor here which can be my eye which is receiving the information. So this particular information or the, the, the light that is coming in here, I will receive it and change it into the impulse, the electrical energy that can be taken to the brain and then be interpreted on what am I really actually seeing or what is it that is happening in the surrounding. So I interpret it. So the actual thing about the receptors is they actually have the ability to detect the stimulus and then change the energy in the stimulus to the impulses that can easily be transmitted and then coordinated and then actually a response is created on them. So that is one thing that is happening here. So we have got various receptors in our body and the type of energy that they can receive. Like I've just said, uh, the eye, in this case, maybe we can talk about the part of the eye, like the retina, the energy that they normally receive, we know, is light. This is one of the energy that they have to change into the impulse. We have the ear as an organ of the receptor here. The ear will basically receive sound. Now, what, what are we really trying to pass across here? That this is my receptor organs. These are the organs. We can call them the sense organs. Now, there is a specific stimulus that is going to come to them. Like I've said, the stimulus that is coming to the eye is the light. Now, this light will not just move to the brain or to the coordinators like it is. This light must be changed. The energy in it must be changed to impulse. And it is the impulse that must be moving to the cells that will be coordinating it and interpreting it so that we can respond to it. If I have got the ear, the ear like I'm talking, there is the sound that I'm producing. This particular sound is going to land into your ear and then your ear can change this particular sound energy into the impulse, like the music itself. So that we really interpret the music like, is it something that we like, we respond by shaking our body, or is it something that is displeasant, you block it so that you don't want to receive it anymore. So it depends on the amount of energy in it and how that energy is interpreted. So these are the things that we should really understand, like the tongue, for example, will be receiving uh, the tongue. The tongue normally receives the chemical like salt. Chemical that is uh, one of the amount, the type of energy that it can receive and then we can interpret it. So there is a lot here, a lot of the receptors here and a lot of the, uh, the, the energy that we receive. Like we have talked about the skin, when you talk about the touch, that particular energy that we are receiving is a mechanical energy. That touch is a mechanical. So the body have to 
interpret that very well. We talk about the skin can also receive the temperature. So that is the heat energy that we can be having in our body. So those are examples of the receptors and the types of the energy that we can receive in our body. So that is one thing that uh, I really want us to understand and respond to. Now, the next thing that I really want us to understand is that uh, we are talking about the system that is involving uh, the transmission of the impulse and the interpretation of this particular impulse so that we can coordinate it. So we have got normally in human being, this particular impulse coordination is involving two organs. So the first organ that we are talking about is the, the nerve system. We have got two systems here. We can talk about the what we are calling, we can refer to it as the central. Uh, we have got the central nerve system. This is one system that we should be trying to understand. The central nervous system. Now, the first thing that I want us to understand is that uh, the biological name of the nerve cell. So we have got what's called nerve cell. So nerve cell, biologically we can call it, uh, this is biological, biological name is neuron. Neuron, that is the name that we are giving to this particular cell. And there are two types of the neurons that we will be talking about in this particular point. So we have got what is called sensory neuron. This is the first, the first cell that I want us to understand. Then uh, we also have got what is called the motor neuron. So these are the two cells that we are going to talk about forming the nerve, the nerve cells. Now these particular cells here, they are found like for example the sensory organ here, I mean sensory, sensory neuron is found in sensory organ, is found in sensory organs. So this is what actually receives the impulse. And after receiving the impulse, it moves with the impulse. It moves the impulse to the uh, spinal cord. And then this particular uh, impulse will be moved to the brain for interpretation. So these two, spinal cord, spinal cord, and brain, these two forms central uh, central nervous system so central nervous system is made up of two things the spinal cord and the brain now basically the spinal cord will be receiving the impulses from various organs and it is channeled to the brain the brain is the actual thing that's going to coordinate and interpret this particular information. Now after this, we also have got another neuron which is taking it outside the central nervous system. So this particular neuron is uh, the motor neuron. So clearly we should be separating them. Motor neuron is actually picking up the information that has been interpreted to the effector organs. So it moves it from, so you can say it transmit uh, impulse from central nervous system to effector so that a response can be created or it you can respond to that particular situation. That is what this particular cell does. So I have got two cells here. Sensory neuron whose work is to pick the uh, the stimulus from the sensory organ and actually quickly change it to the, uh, I mean the energy, the, the, the impulses that are recommended. And then it moves with it to the spinal cord, I mean central nervous system, 
which is actually the spinal cord which will receive it first before being taken to the brain. So that is one thing that's very clear. So that's how we can separate the, the, two, the three things. Sensory neuron is receiving it, the, 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 the stimulus from the sensory organ and then it changes into impulses and then transmit it to the central nervous system. Then motor neuron, the work of motor neuron is to pick the impulse what has been interpreted and take it actually to the effectors whereby a response will be created so you can move away you can enjoy it or whichever response is appropriate to correct the situation where you are that one is being effected affected by the motor neuron the spinal cord and the brain we have said they form the central nervous system whose work is actually to receive the information and interpret it in other words, it coordinates it so that we can have appropriate response happening to it. So that is how these particular cells are. Now the next thing that I want us to understand is how is this particular neuron? Can we understand the structure of the neuron? So I have got the structure of these two neurons that we should be struggling to really see and then we understand. So the first neuron that I want to draw so that we can try to understand is uh, I want to draw for you the sensory neuron. So this one here is a sensory sensory neuron. This is the cell that I'm talking about. So this is my cell. Uh, this is called the sensory neuron. These are the basic parts, components of the, the neuron. So the neuron has got a, a layer that looks like this. If you look at it keenly, this thing is not continuous. It has got some disruptions, like I am indicating there. And then uh, this part here has got this. Yes, this is how the neuron is. This is the neuron. It looks so simple and very clear. Now this part here, this circular part here, we are referring to it as cell body. This is where we have got the nucleus, like every cell. The cells have got the nucleus and the role of the nuclear is to control the activity of the cell. So this particular cell is really controlled by the nucleus which is here and that part that encloses the nucleus is called the cell body now the cell body has got a fluid the fluid part of the cell the cytoplasm this one i'm indicating is the cytoplasm now the cytoplasm here extends to this particular end now when it moves here it gets a membrane that is enclosing it so this membrane is called axon and therefore at this point the fluid that is enclosed by the the axon is a special cytoplasm in this case so we will be calling it axoplasm at this point now this particular axon here as you look at it it's continuous the axon is insulated by a fatty layer which is called myelin myelin sheath myelin sheath. Now this is the part that is enclosing the, uh, the axoplasm. So that part is very much important. Then the disjointing here is done by what's called node of Ranvier. parts here are not of Ranvia. We have got what is called uh, the receptor dendrites here. Receptor dendrites. So this is how the cell looks like. Now maybe we can talk about this particular part a little so that we may understand clearly what they are. So when this particular cell is within the 
the organ, the sensory organ, it will receive the information through the dendrite receptors. That one means that the information will be moving in that direction. So looking at it, the cell body is actually outside the axon, but towards one end. So you look at this distance. So it is outside the axon towards one end. So it is, it is actually slightly outside the central nervous system. So this section here, this section here we can say that this is the section whereby it is getting to central nervous system. Probably the spinal cord. Spinal cord. So that is how the information is moving. So the cell body of the sensory neuron is not reaching the central nervous system. It is outside. Just lately outside the, the spinal cord. Now this particular part, the, the axon is where the impulse is going to be generated as it moves. The myelin sheath actually is to insulate the axon and also to make sure that the impulse is being transmitted quickly. So it is for protection, insulation and fast transmission of an impulse. That is what it does. Then uh, the nucleus, we have just said that control the cell activity, cell bodies enclosing the nucleus. So this is how this cell looks like. Now the next cell is slightly different, though they are almost the same. So we have got what is called the motor, the motor neuron, the motor neuron here. So the motor neuron as a cell, the structure basically more of the same, but it has got a lot of, uh, the cell body itself has got a lot of dendrites. And then the cell body is actually found in one end. So this is how it looks like. This is how it looks like. And then I can say that this part here is having the dendrites also that are getting into the effectors. So in this case I can have my effectors to be this one. So these are the effectors that I'm having here. So just like the other cell, it also has the myelin sheath. So I can indicate the myelin sheath. Myelin sheath. So this is how the cell is. So this is the cell body again. Cell body. This is myelin sheath. Axon. And then this one so I can call the muscles. So actually this size now forms the effector. It is the effector. So it means that the information in this cell will be moving in this direction from the cell body to the effector. So if you look at it keenly, one clear difference between the uh, motor neuron and the sensory neuron is that the motor neuron has got a cell body which is found at one end of the axon. And actually this particular part here, I want you to remember that this part is within central nervous system. So you see, I have got two differences here. Number one difference between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron is, the, look, is the, the, the point where the cell body is. In the sensory neuron, it is outside the axon. Now in the motor neuron, it is at one end of the axon. Difference number two in terms of the situational location, where are they found? This particular cell body is found inside the central nervous system, while the cell body here of the sensory neuron is found outside the nervous system. So there is that particular structural appearance and then the location appearance that gives us the clear difference between the two. Now this cell is a little bit longer as compared to this. That is another thing that we have to know. And then the, 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 the work, what they do, this, the sensory neuron was transmitting impulse from the sensory organ towards the central nervous system. In motor neuron, it takes up the impulse that has been coordinated to the effectors so that 
we actually move, uh, we respond to it. So it's, it's like motor neuron is taking the, the impulse away from central nervous system as the sensory neuron is taking the impulse towards the central nervous system. And that is how they work. And I want us to really understand and differentiate these two cells there like that. Maybe next time we are going to talk about um, how the impulse is transmitted and how we can coordinate it. Uh, now I want us to have an opportunity again and see one of the sensory organs that uh, we have in our body and how it functions and various parts that it has. Now we want to talk about the eye and uh, I want you to know that various organisms have got the eye and different organisms have got different complexity of the eye. Like for example we can see that an organism like the snail has got the eye and the eye of the snail can detect the light but it is not able to form the image on the on the retina. So that is one weakness about that particular eye. We also have with the eye like other animals, like uh, for example the dog that can actually form the image, but this particular eye does not have the ability to distinguish the colors. So therefore the, the dog normally visualizes things as either white or, or black. So that is one different aspect. Apart from it forming the image, that's a thing. But if you look at the human eye, the human eye has got the ability to do all of this because of how complex it is. So I want us to take this opportunity and understand how the human eye will work. Now the first thing that I want us to understand is that the human eye has got various parts and each of these particular parts form different functions. So this is the diagram that I want to use to illustrate this. So at this particular end, this is the front of the eye, what we are able to see or what you can see in an individual eye. This is the front part. Now this part here is enclosed, it is behind something that is inside. So I want us to start looking at it from inside coming outside so that we can actually see what we are talking about. Now I want to take every part and uh, say something little about them. So I want you to look at uh, this part that is called uh, the outer part, the outermost part of the eye, this part here. It goes all the way round. We are calling it sclerotic layer. A short form is the sclera. So that is the inner part of the eye. It is actually made up of a tough membrane to protect the inner part or the inner part of the eye. So this particular membrane, you can follow it with me, it extends up to the front part whereby it is forming a transparent part that is called the cornea and the outer part of it still has got a, a sheet that is also protective that can protect the eye. So in additionally of the sclerotic layer in the front we have a conjunctiva but the conjunctiva is actually for the protection and the cornea is still the transparent part of the sclerotic layer. Both of them is to protect the eye and they are transparent. Like here it is forming a window that can enable light to pass and get into the eye. So that is the part of that particular eye. Then I want to go to the next layer that is, uh, I said, from inside to outside. After the sclerotic layer, there is this other part that goes around the inner part here, what we are calling the choroid layer. The choroid, so you look at it, it goes all the way around the choroid layer, that is still the choroid layer. Now, this choroid layer, basically it is made up of very many uh, cells, or we can call them pigment, like the blood vessels, they are reaching there. Now, why do we have those particular materials there? The choroid layer has got those materials like the blood vessels, like the pigments that actually make it a little bit dark, so that it prevents the internal reflection of light. So when we have got internal reflection here, the vision will be blurred. We will not be seeing things very clearly. So when we have got the light that is not reflected inside, so that we have got only one source of the light, that will make the visions to become very clear. And that is the work of the coral layer. Besides that, we have said that it has got blood, blood vessels. So the blood vessels is to make sure that there is blood that is supplied to those areas and this blood is probably rich in nutrients and oxygen. So this cell, I mean this organ also has got cells that are actually growing. So they need oxygen, they have got living cells, they need nutrients. So the coral layer has got blood vessels that actually nourishes the eye to make it to receive oxygen 
and nutrients and probably also remove the carbon dioxide from it. So that is that particular part that you are able to see there. Now, apart from that, the innermost part is now what you are calling the retina. I can see you are seeing here is called fovea. So fovea is a part of the retina. So this particular dark part here that you are seeing here is an extension of retina. So it goes all around. Now, how is the retina? Now, retina has got the pigments, the light pigments. So we have got two pigments. So we have got what is called the rods. So rods are found in the retina. We, we call them uh, rods and cones. These are light sensitive pigments, pigments of light, of light. So I want you to notice that in every part of the retina, we have got those two, uh, those two pigments. But the only difference is that within the forbear, we have only cones concentrated there. So there are no rods in, in, in forbear. And I said forbear is part of retina. So you can say this one has cones only. The rods are missing. Blind spot is also part of retina. But why do we call it blind spot? Now the first thing, maybe we can take opportunity to understand what these light sensitive pigments do for us. Number one, the rods can perceive light that are of lower intensity. So that one means that we can only use rods to see when we have got dim light, like when you are in a dark room or over the night, because they perceive light of low intensity but they don't perceive colors so it means that when i'm using the rods i cannot see colored object i can only see visualize black and white because they don't perceive colors now cones perceive colors and light of different light wavelengths it can receive light of different light wavelengths and different colors of light like the blue lights you can see the the red lights you can see the yellow lights so when it receives all of those particular lights, the vision will be white, of course. So those particular cones are concentrated on fovea. But that one does not stop them from being in any other part of the retina. I have said that they are found in every part of the retina. But in fovea, what is concerned is mainly cones. Therefore, that is where the image will be formed. The blind spot does not have light pigments. That is why it's called blind spot, because it cannot perceive light, simply because it is missing the pigment. So that is the, the part that we are talking about. Optic nerves are the nerves that are picking up the information that has been formed on the retina to the brain for interpretation. So that is what it does. Now, if we come outside here, there is this part that is found uh, here. This part is called the lens. Actually, the light, the has, the eyes has got the lens that normally refract the image into the retina. So the lens is very important part of the eye. The light, the lens is suspended by what's called suspensory ligaments, which are basically the muscles or the, the tissues there that suspend it. And also we have all the ciliary muscles that are suspending them there. And then we also have all the circular muscles here that are able to stretch so that we can adjust the size of the eye. Now in front of the lens there is the iris. These two, this one and this one, they are all iris. Actually these are muscles again that has got a gap in between them and the gap is called the pupil. That gap is what is going to allow the light to pass through and reach the, the retina for the formation of the image. And then we have talked about the cones. I have said the pupil is the small hole. So the, the iris keep on changing depending on the amount of light that it is receiving. If it receives too much light, it is going to actually shrink so that it becomes too small to stop more light coming from in that can cause damage to the eye. So it is actually, the iris actually regulates the size of the pupil that will help us to see what we are supposed to see in the eye. So that is the various parts of the eye that we are supposed to be talking about. Now we also have to know that this eye here will be helping us in the image formation. So we can talk about how do we form the image. So we have got uh, image formation. 
Now the image is formed within the retina. That is one thing that we have to know. That the image of the eyes form the retina. So the object that you are seeing reflects light. And that light that it's reflecting is what is coming into our eye. So by the time this particular light is reflected, the pupil will open up, the iris will be relaxing so that the, the, the lens, I mean the lens can receive the light, and then the lens refract the light into the retina so that we can form the image. And basically the image that is formed there is upside down due to the refraction of light by the lens and the liquid part of the eye that's called the aqueous humerus that is actually bending the light that is being received by it towards the retina so that the image is formed. So the image is uh, upside down and that is why sometimes we say that the eye actually doesn't see. What sees is the brain. Because after that the brain will be picking up that uh, image and transmitting it to the brain so that it is going to be interpreted and that is what will be enabling you to see it as actually it is upright rather than how the image is formed in the retina which is upside down. So that is what actually happen when we are talking about the receiving of the light. So the next time we meet, we'll be talking about the iris and the reflex actions, how they normally occur, how the reflexes are, and then what make us to be able to see. Otherwise, thank you very much. We'll meet next time and we'll be talking about if any case you have got a question or a part that is not clear for you, maybe you can ask us the question 